Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Ann Thomas, and this is Shiloh United Church of Christ in Danville, PA, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. It's good to see all of you here in person. I also want to welcome those who are joining us by audio and uh, audio recording and social media. If you're live streaming with us this morning, give us a hello in the chat box so we can welcome you. If you appreciate this church and these services, please like us on Facebook or simply forward the recording to your friends and other family members and invite them to check us out. I want to share a few announcements with you before the worship service begins. Our offering plates are at the back of the room for you to leave your financial gifts to Shiloh. If you're worshiping online today, you can help support our ministries by donating electronically through our webpage at shilohucc.org, or you can simply write a check and mail it in. We thank all of you for the way, many ways you continue to support the work here at Shiloh. We have a prayer team that wants to pray for your joys and concerns. If you have something or someone you would like to, a, a prayer for, you can write it down on a prayer request form located in the pew racks and leave it in the prayer bowl at the back of the room on your way out. Those live streaming with us can write your requests in the chat feature and you can always email or phone requests into the office anytime, and we'll forward them to our prayer team. I want to let you know that our church council has called for a special congregational meeting following worship on Sunday, June the 11th. The purpose of this meeting is to share what has been done since the last meeting when we elected a new treasurer and uh, to give you a, a review of our current financial situation. So please plan to attend that meeting. There were things left over from the indoor yard sale downstairs, so after the service, if you'd like, you can go down. Uh, I'll put out a basket and you can make a contribution. Don't, you don't have to go by the prices that we charged. Just give anything. You want to give a quarter, 50 cents, anything at all will help our cause. I think we did pretty well, and I'd like to thank everyone who helped with the yard sale. We had quite a turnout. There is more in your bulletins. We hope you'll take them home with you and look them over carefully for ministries and fellowship opportunities that you can participate in. Let's prepare for worship. During the prelude, we invite you to quiet your mind, open your heart, and breathe deeply of the Spirit of Christ that is here with us.
When the Feast of Pentecost came, the followers of Jesus were all together in one place. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. And then, like wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run. Then when they heard, one after another, their own mother tongues being spoken, they were amazed. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on. Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head or tail of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused. What's going on here? Others joked, ha, ah, they're drunk on cheap wine. And that's when Peter stood up and, backed by the other eleven, spoke out with bold urgency. Fellow Jews, all of you who are visiting Jerusalem, listen carefully and get this story straight. These people aren't drunk, as some of you suspect. This is what the prophet Joel announced would happen. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young men will see visions, your old men dream dreams. When the time comes, I will pour out my spirit on all who serve me. I will set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, and whoever calls out to me for help will be saved. May we gather together body, mind, heart, and soul, and worship our God. of love and power, on the sacred day of Pentecost, open up the heavens and pour out upon us the living spirit of Jesus. Let his glorious coming fill us with wisdom and understanding, with new life and energy, with awe and wonder. May his spirit draw us together so that we may worship you in unity with faith and trust, with joy and excitement, with the burning hope and confident expectation that will sustain us through this day and all our days to come. Mighty God, let the sacred wind blow and the holy fire burn until our hearts and souls belong once more only to you. O oh God, hear our prayer, for we lift it up to you now through the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>
Sydsteds besætte. Good morning. Our first scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verse 19 through 23. On that very first Easter day, when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he appeared to his followers. It was at that moment that Jesus commissioned the faith community to continue his ministry by giving them the power of God's Holy Spirit Listen now for the inspired word. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Our next reading comes from the first letter of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 12, verse 3 through 13. Paul wrote this letter to the church that was divided with factions competing with one another for power and recognition. In these verses, he describes the faith community as being like a human body. It is made up of a variety of different parts, each one blessed by God for a particular purpose. All parts are meant to work together in harmony. If the body is to function as God intends, listen once more for the inspired word. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. They are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. The human body has many parts, and they make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit and we all share the same spirit. This is the inspired word. Thanks be to God. I'm 
sharing our joys and concerns is an important way for us to build community as we pray with and for one another. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that in just a moment. I do want to remind you, though, that we are recording and posting our services on social media. So if you're going to share something about someone else, please make sure you have their permission to do so. Uh, we are continuing to pray for Kathy Spatola's nephew, John. Uh, he has been diagnosed with cancer of the stomach, which unfortunately has already spread. He did recently receive a port for receiving chemotherapy treatments, and those treatments are scheduled to begin this coming week. Uh, the goal is to try to shrink the tumor to give him some relief from some ongoing pain. So we do pray the medications will do what they need to and that John and his whole family will have all the support that they need. We've been asked to pray for Katie Sue. She's a young grandmother in our community who was in a coma for the past six years. She is now out of that coma and seems to be doing rather well. And we do pray that her healing will continue. It's good to have Ruth Spock Shepherson with us. Uh, she did have emergency surgery on her hand to deal with an infection this past week. Um, that uh, did go well. She's on antibiotics though and has to protect it and keep it bandaged for a while yet. So we do pray for continued healing for her and that there will be no more complications. Uh, Sandy Runyon is also doing well following her shoulder replacement surgery. Uh, she is scheduled to have staples taken out next week um, and then the really hard physical therapy will begin. So we do pray for continued healing for Sandy. Uh, Ruth Laddermilk shared earlier in the week that her niece Kathy has been released from the hospital and is now at Grandview. Uh, hopefully she'll get some rehab before going home again. Uh, she's been dealing with an awful lot since a pretty serious stroke last November, but her spirits remain good and her family is very hopeful that she will continue to improve. Um, we're adding Sean Hendricks to our prayer list. Uh, he's been dealing with a lot of lower back pain. Uh, right now he is scheduled to have surgery on June 12th, although the doctors are trying to get him in sooner. So we pray for good management in the meantime and when that procedure happens that it will work for him. Uh, we also uh, want to hold the Weeder family in prayer, Judy and uh, grandson Ethan. We're supposed to provide special music for us today, but I understand they're under the weather. Uh, so we're going to reschedule them, but we will pray that they will feel better soon. Uh, and this is Memorial Day weekend. It is time to remember with gratitude the uh, people who gave their life through military service for our country in the name of freedom and justice. May our remembrances also be a call for us to renew work for peace. I've shared a bit, but let me invite you. Do we have other joys or concerns to share? All right. I trust there are other joys and concerns among us, and I invite you to take a moment, think of someone you would like to lift up to God in prayer, trace their name in the palm of your hand, and hold them as we pray. Let us pray. Holy God, spirit of life and love, we come before you on this Pentecost day to celebrate the gift of your presence with us. We lift up our praise for your faithfulness and your steadfast love that will never let us go. We thank you for the trust you have given us, calling us to be partners with you in revealing your truth to the world. And we come before you with hope that you will touch and renew our lives once more. Spirit of truth, even as we rejoice in the ways you shape and guide our lives, we confess that we are not always the people you desire us to be. We claim to discover your presence and the beauty of a wooded path and the bright colors of a rainbow, but we often assume you are absent when a hurricane or earthquake destroys life. 
We are quick to label people as intelligent, beautiful, and important, and just as quick to label others as lazy, difficult, or worthless. We lift up our hands to you with thanks for daily bread and blessings, even as we close our hands to those in need. We know that with you all things are possible, yet too often we choose to act as though change is impossible. Oh God, forgive us. I ask that you come to us now. Receive each of our concerns as we lift them up to you. Help us to open our hearts as fully as we are able that we may receive the love and joy that you desire to give to us. May your Holy Spirit move around within and through us until we know with a certainty that you are present with us. O oh, Holy One, come and bless us now with the quiet, gentle grace of your touch. Precious Jesus, on this Memorial Day weekend, we lift up to you the heroes of our nation and of our faith, the people who throughout history have fought, suffered, endured, and died that we might know freedom and the hope of your justice and mercy in this world. Bless them and their examples of service, and bless us that we might continue in that legacy. Bless us once more as we join our voices and spirits with your saints of every time and place, praying the words you have given to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today is Pentecost. It's a special day in the calendar of the Christian church when we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit to Jesus' followers. Now, we heard a little about that event in the call to worship. Jesus' followers were gathered together when suddenly all hell broke loose. A violent wind swirled around them. Everyone's hair caught on fire, and they all seemed to be talking in foreign languages. Now, if that happened here, I have no doubt our safety team would be right on it, calling 911 and evacuating the building. But what happened that day represents the fulfillment of what Jesus promised his disciples right before he ascended into heaven, that they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and would be empowered to take over his ministry. But what exactly was Jesus promising with the coming of the Holy Spirit? Well, to answer that, I want to take a look at one more scripture reading. This one comes from the book of Numbers. And this book describes what happens when the ancient Israelites wandered through the wilderness on their way from Egypt to the Promised Land. And God chose Moses to be their leader. Moses was the one who met with God face to face, who relayed God's word to the people, who mediated the people's concerns and fears up to God. In other words, Moses had a lot of power and responsibility. Whenever there was a complaint, Moses was the one the people turned to, and the people had a lot of complaints. The trip was taking too long. Their feet hurt. There wasn't any water to drink or food to eat. It was hard sleeping on the ground. The sun came up too early. They missed everything they used to know in Egypt. At one particular time, the people complained about having to eat the same old boring thing every day. God provided the manna, but there were only so many ways to prepare it. What they wanted was meat. So they complained to Moses. 
who normally would have passed the complaint on up the chain to God. Only this time, Moses was tired of it all, so he offered his own complaint, saying to God, Why did you burden me with all these stubborn, ungrateful people? I've had enough. If this is the way you're going to treat me, then just kill me now. Yeah, Moses was a bit of a drama queen. But listen to what happened next. Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather before me 70 men who are recognized as elders and leaders of Israel. Bring them to the tent of meeting to stand there with you. I will come down and talk to you there. I will take some of the spirit that is upon you, and I will put the spirit upon them also. They will bear the burden of the people along with you, so you will not have to carry it alone. So Moses went out and reported the Lord's words to the people. He gathered the 70 elders and stationed them around the tent of meeting, and the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to Moses. Then he gave the 70 elders the same spirit that was upon Moses. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But this never happened again. The two men, Eldad and Medad, had stayed behind in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but they had not gone out to the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. Yet the spirit rested upon them as well, so they prophesied there in the camp. The young man ran and reported to Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' assistant since his youth, protested, Moses, my master, make them stop. But Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them all. Then Moses returned to the camp with the elders of Israel. Moses had a complaint. He had too much work and responsibility for one person to handle. It sounded like God came up with a good solution. Select 70 people that Moses knew could be good leaders. God would give them some of the same spirit that God gave Moses, and that way Moses would have help and not have to do everything himself. Easy peasy, right? But as they say, no good deed goes unpunished, and the fix to the problem actually resulted in more complaints. So what went wrong? Unfortunately, Joshua was the one who complained about the solution. Why? Most likely because things did not turn out at all the way Joshua expected or wanted them to. Consider that Joshua was Moses' number two guy, second in command. He was all about running a tight ship, everything in order and under control. That way there wouldn't be any surprises. And when you're trying to move 600,000 people through the wilderness, you don't need any surprises. My guess is Joshua thought the plan to share Moses' workload was a good one. The 70 men, no women allowed, would be handpicked to make sure they were the best candidates based on their qualifications, work history, and personal references. And it was good that they were going to be outside the camp at the tent of meeting when the spirit was divided up and given to them. That way, they could control access and ensure only those who were supposed to be there were there. After all, the spirit could be dangerous if it got loose or fell into the wrong hands, and they certainly did not want any of it to be wasted. And then the moment came. The 70 made a perimeter around the tent of meeting. They bowed their heads, and God divided the spirit and placed a portion in each of them, and they began prophesying. And that was wonderful, just as expected and all according to plan. But the celebration was short-lived as someone rushed up to Joshua and exclaimed, Eldad and Medad are in the camp prophesying just like these 70 men. And Joshua knew that that was not supposed to happen. Although they were registered, they had not been chosen to receive any spirit, and they were inside the camp among everyone else. How did the spirit get to them? And did that mean the 70 men didn't get the full measure of the spirit that they were supposed to? And if they were all outside the camp and Eldad and Medad were inside the camp, could they even be sure it was the same spirit? What if it continued to spread where it didn't belong? So Joshua did what he had to do. He told Moses to make them stop. 
They had not been chosen. They were not worthy of such a thing. They were infringing on Moses' own authority and responsibility as the leader. They were taking something that rightfully belonged to the 70 elders, and they couldn't possibly know how to use it properly. It was as if Joshua did not believe God was capable of being both inside and outside the camp at the same time, or that God's spirit was big enough to rest on 70 people plus a few more. Now that kind of thinking might make sense if God's blessings and presence are finite commodities. If something is in limited supply, you should make sure you use and distribute that limited amount wisely and not waste any of it. You also want to make sure those who really need it, including yourself, have what they need before you risk sharing it with anyone else. But rather than agree with Joshua, Moses said, let them alone. It's a good thing they have this spirit. I wish everyone had this spirit. In other words, Moses was humble, willing to share whatever leadership power he had with others, willing to accept that others might have good ideas or abilities he had never recognized before. He did not hold himself up as an expert in leadership or in talking to God or as the best of the best at anything. And he did not feel threatened that anyone else's abilities would somehow diminish or subtract from who he was or what he could do. Now, it's easy to pick on Joshua in this story, but I wonder if we in the church aren't sometimes a bit more like him than we would care to admit. We don't always want to welcome new leadership on established committees or welcome new ideas from folks that haven't been here very long. We've never done it that way. We've always done it this way, we say. Too often, we in the church establish barriers to prevent people from getting too close to God's blessings. We set up rules about who can share in communion and be baptized and what it takes to remain a member in good standing while holding at arm's length, even rejecting those who don't quite fit the mold. And too often, we in the church prioritize the organizational structure, trying to fit people and skills into specific traditional committees whether they have the necessary gifts for that ministry or not. At one point in time, it was thought you could not be a church unless you had a stewardship committee, a finance committee, a grounds committee, a music committee, a kitchen committee, a children's education committee, and a women's fellowship committee. Men's committees were optional. As if all of those committees are required and there's no room for anything else. So are we really like Moses, welcoming God's spirit wherever and in whomever it appears? Or might we be more like Joshua, setting up boundaries so we can manage and control God's spirit? Now, it's not just a problem for us today. That was a problem for the early church as well. And I think that's why John the Gospel writer and Paul the Apostle both wrote about it. And we heard words from them in our earlier scripture readings. John's gospel does not have a specific story about the Holy Spirit coming on Pentecost 50 days after Easter. What John described instead was Jesus appearing to his disciples on the same day he was resurrected from the dead. While he was with them, he breathed on them, giving them the gift of the Holy Spirit. He then commissioned them to continue his ministry and work. And there are a couple of things I want to point out to you in this text. First, I think we tend to assume that Jesus appeared only to his 11 closest disciples, the 12 minus Judas. But in John's gospel, very rarely is Jesus only with that specific group. Usually when John mentions disciples, he's referring to a fairly large gathering of people. Old, young, male, female, Jew, non-Jew, wealthy, poor. So we should imagine the whole community gathered when Jesus breathed on them. He did not single out any individuals or any group. They all received the Spirit, which is exactly what Moses wanted. The other thing I want you to notice is that Jesus commissioned his followers what he commissioned them to do. He empowered them to forgive and retain sins. 
Now that word sin is troublesome because we tend to interpret this to mean that we as followers of Jesus have been given the power and responsibility to judge right from wrong and to condemn and forgive. But that is not what sin means here. For John, sin is a theological failing, not a moral behavioral offense. To be in sin is to be blind to the revelation of God in Jesus. And what Jesus is actually calling and empowering the faith community to do is not to judge one another for wrongdoing, but to continue the work of making God's love and grace visible to the world. Sins will be forgiven when people repent and turn back to God in community. Sins will be retained when the community fails to demonstrate love by holding people accountable to a greater common good. Whenever we act as though we know what God would forgive and what God would condemn, it's like building a wall around God's grace to make sure only those most worthy will receive it. And we end up putting ourselves in the place of God, effectively presenting God to the world in our image rather than molding ourselves to the image of God's unbounded love and grace. And consider again how the Apostle Paul described the faith community to the Corinthians. He noted that most organizational structures are pyramid-shaped. There's one person at the top, and power flows down from that person through several layers of managers. It's ordered by layers of hierarchy, And its purpose is to maintain the structure so the ones who have power remain in power. And Paul said it's not supposed to be that way with the body of Christ, the church. In the church, the body is arranged differently and is structured so that gifts of service are empowered to be brought forth no matter what they are or who they are found in. And leadership can be shared equitably to promote a common good. It's a lot harder to run an organization that way. It takes a lot more cooperation, a lot more give and take. But it is one way to ensure the mission, demonstrating and sharing God's love, is the priority over maintaining the status quo. And Paul goes on to say that each person has a portion of God's spirit, some good or ability or talent that they are able and meant to contribute not for their own benefit or gain, but for the benefit of the whole community as it seeks to live out its particular mission in that particular time and place. That means that some spiritual gifts will come and go depending on the current needs of the community. It also means that each and every person is necessary to the healthy functioning of the community and it ensures the community is flexible to be able to respond to changes in circumstances and needs as they arise. And David Bland, a preacher and author, describes the gifts of the Holy Spirit this way. The gift of the Spirit is not a finite commodity, but is better compared to a gift like wisdom. When a person shares wisdom with another, this act does not diminish the wisdom of the giver. Rather, it's like using a candle to light other candles. The candle does not lose its light because it shares it with others. Rather, the light becomes even brighter when it is shared. The older I get, the more I realize that faith is not meant to be about obeying rules and commandments or fitting life into a particular mold. Nor is faith about having all the right answers. Instead, faith is about the way God's grace is always, always bending, reshaping, transforming our rules and answers to the questions in order to bring forth life, energy, joy, and true community. And that happens quite often in unexpected ways. Today is Pentecost the day we celebrate the gift of God's power and grace in the coming of the Holy Spirit. I encourage you in these days ahead to think about this. In what people and situations do you expect to see God's power and grace revealed? In what people and situations do you not expect 
to see God's power and grace revealed. And if you are not expecting to see God's grace and power, what does that say about your understanding of God as well as the people around you? Amen. invite you to join me in the words of our benediction as they're printed on page three in our bulletins. The Lord said to Moses, is the Lord's power limited? So I want you to think about that question in your life and our life together. In what ways do we intentionally or unintentionally limit the flow and the grace and the power of God's presence? Receive now every blessing from on high. Be filled to overflowing with God's love for you. Be strengthened by God's steadfast presence with you so that you can go forth and share God's love with one another. Amen. Amen.